Today, we are gonna talk about ballistics gel, what we can learn from it, what we cannot, and maybe more importantly, why am I holding a sword? George back at you with the New Hunter's Guide, the YouTube channel, and a very interesting podcast, helping new hunters get started and bringing new insights to all hunters. Today, I wanna to talk to you guys about ballistics gel. There has been a lot of talk on the internet, people saying things like ballistics gel is the be all end all. It gives us conclusive evidence about the effectiveness of different shotgun shot and how it's able to take ducks and turkeys and pheasants and everything else. And then you got people on the other side side of the aisle saying that ballistics gel is meaningless. It has no value whatsoever in helping us determine the effectiveness of ammunition. Well, what is the truth? I'm going to investigate that today, give you guys the real story, but first I want to tell you a little bit about what ballistics gel is and what we have to do to use it for all of these videos that you guys see me do where we're shooting ballistics gel with all different kinds of ammunition and everything that we're trying to learn from it. So ballistics gel has been around for a a long time, decades and decades, in one form or another. Years ago, they almost exclusively used a bio gel, which was essentially gelatin. They would mix it, similar to jello, but a lot thicker. You don't want to eat this stuff. And they would calibrate it at a very specific temperature and density in order to get the results that they wanted. And they would test ammunition in that gel. Depending on how far the round went into the gel, you would be able to calculate how much ballistic energy that that projectile had. And a lot of the times it was done with shotgun shot, but of course it's also used for rifle and handgun ammo as well. Now when they first did ballistics gel a long time ago, it was very difficult to get consistent results because it had to be calibrated to very specific temperatures. It only lasted so long if you took it outside and it started to warm up, things went haywire. So you had to have climate control places in order to test it. Fast forward, today we have shelf stable ballistics gel and there's two major kinds we've got 10% FBI gel and we have 20% FBI gel now I use primarily the 10% as do most of the people on YouTube because it gives us the widest range of penetration so you can get the most accurate measurements and help determine with precision how deep did your pellets go but 20% ballistics gel it's the same stuff except it has essentially double the density so a pellet that would go one one inch deep in 20% gel would go two inches deep in 10% gel, or vice versa. If it went 10 inches deep in 10% gel, it's only gonna go five inches deep in 20% gel. And 20% gel is primarily bought and used by the military because they are testing higher power projectiles, things like 223 ammo and higher caliber stuff. So if you were using 10% gel, you would need so much it would be unreasonable. So with 20% gel, you can use about half as much. Now, now, connecting the dots to the past, there's a lot of gel tests out there and a lot of data that people are quoting from the 1960s and 1970s saying you need X number of inches of penetration to do whatever job you want. A very common statistic thrown around is you need 1.5 inches of gel penetration to kill a duck. Now, that calibration is based on bio gel that they used a long time ago, and there is nobody still alive today that can let us know exactly what the calibration of that was. So people try to apply that statistic to 10% FBI gel, and it really doesn't work. The best minds in the industry that I'm aware of have figured that the historic gel used in those ancient tests is more akin to the 20% gel that we have today. It's not going to be exact, but it's closer to the 20% calibration than the 10%, which means you need more like three inches inches of penetration to kill a duck. And there's lots of other things floating around in there. So today companies like Clear Ballistics make a shelf stable gel that they can ship and it keeps at any temperature. The stuff works great. That's what I've been using. But guys, what it takes in order to make this stuff work, you just do not realize. It looks so great on camera. Oh, you shoot the ballistics gel, you look at the pellets, you count them, you measure how deep they are. It's amazing. It's just so easy. And it is in that moment. 
until you're done doing the test. And then you have to go through this long, arduous process in order to prep the gel to be reused. So you have one big, long block of gel. If you shoot it, now it's full of pellets, and you can only really use it one time. So I always cut the gel up into three pieces. That way I can do three videos, or at least three tests, even if they're in one video, with the same full-size block of gel. But then I've got to take those three big pieces of gel, squish them together, and somehow jam them back down into their mold. All right, you got to just, it, it's hard, it's difficult. The instructions tell you to tear the gel apart, pull all the pellets out of the gel, or cut the gel up, pull all the pellets out of it, then pile all the pieces of gel back into the mold and melt it down that way. And yeah, I've tried that. And this gel tears apart about as easy as a block of iron. All right, that is completely ridiculous and unfeasible for shotgun pellets. So we jam it all back together in the mold as best as we can. Then we've got to throw it into the oven and we've got to bake this gel at about 260 degrees Fahrenheit for somewhere between six to 10 hours. Check it occasionally. And what we're waiting for is one for the gel to remelt and fuse back together, but also for all of the pellets to sink down to the very bottom of the block of gel. We check it every now and then. Finally, when it's done, we look at it. We make sure the pellets are at the bottom. The air bubbles have come to the top. Then we got to turn it off and let it sit in the oven overnight so we can cool down. Pull it out of the oven and then we have the test that taxes all of the strength and your fingers and hands to try to pry this gel out of the mold. You got to pull it back, release it from the edges. You got to pull it as hard as you can to get some air in around the sides and in the bottom. And then you have to heave and tug and pull and it usually takes somewhere between 10 and 20 minutes exhausting your arms to finally free this gel from the mold. Once you've got it free, now you've got to somehow get all of the pellets out of the bottom of the gel. So I use a metal shish kebab skewer. I found that works the best. And then one by one, I've got to pop dozens, if not hundreds of pellets, whether it's number nine TSS, number four bismuth, number two steel, whatever it is, we got to pop all of these out of the gel and finally get it free and clear. Now, once the gel is free and clear, then we need to divide it back into three parts to be used. And I have tried everything that I could come up with for this. I have used every knife that I've had. I've used my kitchen knives, the bread knife. I've used the hacksaw, wood saw, everything, and nothing works. This stuff is ridiculously difficult to cut, extraordinarily difficult. The only thing I could think of that might work is a sword. You might say, George, why do you have a sword laying around. Well, when I was in college another lifetime ago through undergrad and then partway through grad school, I studied Haydn Gum Do, which is Korean swordsmanship, as well as several other martial arts. And of course, if you do that long enough, you end up having to get a sword or two. And these swords have literally done nothing but sit locked in my gun case for the last 15 to 20 years with no purpose in this world until now. And we're finally able to do something with it. It works really reasonably well to cut this ballistics gel. But still, you got to lean it over the edge of the table, push down on the outer side, and cut it right between the seam, use gravity as well as leverage in order to try to get it to separate while you're sawing it with the sword. But finally, it does work. Cut it up, get it now into three different pieces, and now the gel's cut. Now I've got to wrap it in plastic in order to keep it protected so stuff doesn't stick to it, grass, dust, dirt, bugs, anything else. And then I can wrap it up, put it in the mold, and now it's ready to go for next time. So every time you guys see me use ballistics gel in a test video for turkey or waterfowl or something else, I've got to go through this ridiculous process. And of course the gel's not cheap. It costs somewhere around $100 to $120 per block, and the mold costs about that much as well. And no, the block of gel does not last forever either. This stuff has a shelf life. All right, you can only remelt it so many times according to the manufacturer, and then it just gets too cloudy. You can't see through it, and it may even start to break down. I'm not sure. This is not my first block of gel either. It's just the one that's currently in service. So doing all these test videos, it takes a lot 
lot of time and energy behind the scenes and it costs a pretty penny to get this gel and the mold and everything else that you need which is why I am so thankful for all of my Patreon supporters. You guys help make these videos possible. I really appreciate it. Guys, if you've been watching these videos, I would really encourage you to click the link down below in the description and consider supporting the channel on Patreon. You might as well at least give it a thumbs up, help this video reach more people. And if you like test videos, experiments, reviews, kicking the tires on assumptions, this is a good channel for you. Go ahead and hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. Now, what can we learn from ballistics gel? I'm going to start on the other side of the question and talk about what we can't learn, the weaknesses. All right, ballistics gel is designed to simulate tissue. All right, but ducks and turkeys and everything else are not five or six or 10 inches of solid tissue, right? You've got feathers, you've got skin, you've got bone, you've got organs, you've got blood, you've got all kinds of stuff in there, which means ballistics gel is not able to tell us exactly what is going to kill a bird or any animal that we're hunting more or less effectively. All right, there's a lot of different things in water fowl alone, the pellets, what they're made out of makes a big difference. Steel shot has basically no give to it and is more likely to ricochet off a bone. Whereas bismuth shot does have some give and it will deform on impact, making it a little bit more likely to smash through bone. However, if the impact is too great, the bismuth is a little bit more brittle and it could break. So there's a lot of factors that go into what makes a pellet more effective. You got different shapes of pellets these days. So no, ballistics gel cannot tell us what the most effective ammunition is going to be for dropping a duck or a goose or a turkey or a dove or anything else that you're shooting at. There are just too many variables involved with living animals for a homogeneous mixture like ballistics gel to be able to give us this one answer for what's going to be more effective. So it is not the be all end all. However, ballistics gel is valuable because what it can do is it can let us know what the terminal ballistics energy and penetration of anything that we're shooting at it is, most specifically when we compare it to something else. The temperature of any given day is going to impact how deep something penetrates in the gel. Hotter days, you're going to get more penetration. Colder days, you're going to get less. Also, the temperature and barometric pressure impacts shotgun ammo performance and velocity. So not only is the gel going going to be a little more or less dense, your pellets are going to be moving a little faster, a little slower, depending on the temperature. So the only thing we can get a bulletproof test on is what we shoot into the gel under the same conditions. So if I test two different ammunitions or two different distances, I need to shoot that test right now at the same time. And that's what I always do. I shoot one end of the block of gel, I turn the gel, and I immediately shoot the other one. So you can see the entry holes from both sides so we're able to tell how each round did. If I shot one today and another tomorrow, you would not be able to compare that data because all the conditions with temperature and barometric pressure are different. All right, every test has to be done same day, same time, same conditions, same gel. But it does give us a very good statistically significant and precision instrument to get some learnings about how powerful and ammunition is, how much penetration it could have in a target. So we have something that we can compare different ammos and different ranges with. I did some turkey ammo testing in ballistics gel where I tested the same ammo at 40 yards and then 60 yards right at the same time, one after another, and the results were massive. So while ballistic gel is not the only metric of effectiveness, nor necessarily even the most important metric of effectiveness, it is still valuable and it can teach us some very helpful things. Check out this video right here where I did a ballistics gel test with some waterfowl ammo, steel versus bismuth. Or check out this video here where I did some turkey ammo, lead versus TSS shot. Guys, thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate you. Till next time, God bless you and go get them in the woods.